Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Can a narcissist leader actually be of strategic benefit? My name is John Purvis. I'm from CCIQ and I'm your facilitator for today. Joining us is Associate Professor Michael Segan, Head of Programs, Master of International Business and Master of Management for Engineers. Some tips for today's session will be online for approximately 40 minutes and following the main presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. Please send your questions through for Michael at any stage by using the text box on the screen. Following the session, we will email all participants a copy of the presentation, a link and additional supporting information. Please check your, uh, your inboxes later today. It is commonly thought those leaders with personality faults such as narcissism tend to be destructive for organisations because their focus is purely on the self. Undeniably, narcissists can be just as destructive as corporate psychopaths and incompetent managers. However, there are actually certain types that can provide a strategic benefit to organisations. These positive narcissists have been shown to generate important strategic initiatives, like to clarify a vision that can provide guidance for employees and aligned corporate initiatives. Michael presented corporate psychopaths in his previous webinar, and this is part two of dealing with those difficult personality types. The presentation will consider the positive narcissists from the accepted leadership perspectives, including transactional and transformative approaches. It will also contrast potential negative aspects of narcissists within the context of more ethical leadership models that seek to recognise followers as ends in themselves rather than means to an end. Welcome, Michael, and over to you. Thank you, John. I'm sure all of you would be uh, aware of the fact that this past weekend um, we've had some major sporting events, um, commonly known as the Festival of the Boot. We've had the AFL Grand Final and the NRL Grand Finals. Um, and in both cases, uh, underdogs uh, became the, uh, the champions. In the case of the AFL, it was the Western Bulldogs, a team that hadn't won a grand final for something like 60 odd years and was clearly the uh, the local favourite to win. And in the NRL it was uh, Cronulla who uh, unfortunately beat my team, the Melbourne Storm. But it was nice to see again another underdog that hadn't won a premiership to actually become the champions of the league. In the aftermath and the discussions that have been going on here in Melbourne on our various radio stations, the other day, uh, there was a discussion about the importance of leadership, and there was a session conducted with the uh, with uh, with listeners through the talkback, uh, asking them, you know, what what do you see as the critical skills and attributes of effective leaders, both from an administrative point of view that has been able to really bring these clubs um, from being perennial cellar dwellers and strugglers you know, to financial uh, security and then of course the coaches of the two teams and the senior leadership of the two teams and how they have transformed the performance on the ground of these two clubs. What was interesting is that when you heard people talking about what they saw as the attributes of leadership they focused on what I would call largely transactional issues. Those things that were related to working with other people, you know, uh, hearing, being good listeners, being able to create a vision, working with people, recognizing their needs and creating a sense of culture and belongingness. Uh, no one actually mentioned any negative attributes. No one spoke about being selfish. No one spoke about um, um, using power um, in a negative way, or for that matter, using people. And yet, there is some evidence to suggest that to be effective leaders, there needs to be elements of that. In particular, the uh, issues of wanting to self be focused on the self and achieving 
uh, something for your for your own sake. Um, what people like Hertzberg and Maslow refer to as affiliative and egoistic needs. So I thought, having done a uh, a webinar a couple of months ago on corporate psychopath, as John mentioned, that it would be interesting to look at <clears throat> narcissism because they're not exactly the same. And once you start looking into this example, these characteristics of narcissists, you realize that it, it, it's not as straightforward as it may seem. Narcissists can be extraordinarily damaging. There's no, no um, no two ways about it. But they're not the same as a corporate psychopath. And what I'd like to do in our presentation uh, today is to basically talk about what narcissism is, what the attributes of a narcissistic leader are, what are their strengths and weaknesses. And throughout the presentation, I'll try to give some examples of some people that all of us would know. Um, and whilst I'm not saying that these people are specifically narcissistic, um, they do display some aspects and some characteristics of that, and we're inferring from what we see. Uh, for example, we could look at people like Peter Credlin, who was the advisor to the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. We could look at Tony Abbott as a leader, and then the previous uh, leader, uh, Kevin Rudd, from the Labour Party. These three people, and you could even put Julia Gillard in there as well, seem to have some aspects that were quite clearly narcissistic. Um, and the question is, did that assist them to get to those sort of lofty positions, or were they hindrances? Um, or, as in perhaps Tony Abbott's case, those attributes that made him so effective as an opposition leader didn't seem to be as beneficial once he became the leader. So the first thing I think we want to talk about is those aspects of dysfunctional personality. Um, clearly we do hire people uh, to lead our organizations, to head up our departments, to be our supervisors, to adopt those leadership and managerial roles. As I said in my previous presentation, I highlighted a couple of the characteristics or the negative characteristics of of some personalities, and we, we talked about corporate psych psychopaths um, and these sorts of people that are extraordinarily destructive. Corporate psychopaths are not beneficial. Um, they like playing power games. They like using people. They like destroying people. Uh, for them, they get a thrill out of it. Um, they display the characteristics of true psychopaths, and this is seen as a, um, in, in fact, a, a type of disorder. Peter Principal or incompetent managers are slightly different. These people have a sense of, uh, of self-worth or a grandiose sense of self-worth, but it's largely because no one's told them that they're not very good. Um, Peter Principal managers tend to be those that are appointed to a position and they look good on paper, they even sound good in the interview, but when they end up in the job, they can't seem to do the job very well. Rather than tackling that issue head on, organizations tend to move these people on to other organizations or from within a department to another department within an organization. They recommend this person to others. <clears throat> they build up the self-image of this person. So they actually believe this incompetent manager, this Peter Principal manager, actually believes they're very, very good. Um, and it's commonly uh, talked about that um, Peter Prinzel managers are promoted to the highest degree of incompetence. And unfortunately, we only tend to find out about these managers when they become or when they adopt very, very senior positions. The narcissist, however, is slightly different. They share some of the characteristics of the corporate psychopath, more so than the Peter Principal manager. And certainly they can be dis very destructive but they can also be quite productive. Um, and I think that there probably is a degree of narcissism that, if not crucial, is certainly advantageous to people who want to become successful leaders. So what is a narcissist? Um, narcissism is one of the three personality types that 
Sigmund Freud actually identified. We won't go into the other two, but he did point out that these people basically um, can give fresh stimulus to cultural development. These people can provide vision. These people do in fact share or um, have characteristics that that um, are um, that, that emphasize their, the, the opportunity. They, they, they take on leadership roles, but they can also, as he says, damage the established state of affairs. As you see in the second point, they are often emotionally isolated. They're highly distrustful of other people, and they can become very, very angry if they feel they're being threatened or undermined. And we'll talk about this a little bit, little bit later. One of the problems is that as they achieve things, what we find is that they got, start to feel as if they're superior, that they're, they have a sense of, of grandiosity, as he said. These negative characteristics tend to lead people to think that narcissism is actually very, very negative. And while certainly it can be destructive, Michael Maccabee actually says, actually there are aspects of these things which can be extraordinarily useful. So, the success of narcissists, why do we see them um, being successful? To some extent, they share some of these characteristics with the corporate psychopath. Well, one of the reasons is because they focus very much on themselves, they tend to be more motivated. They are very, very highly competitive. They want to succeed. And they're politically astute. This is the other thing that is very, very important. They can read who are the people that they need to know, who are the people that have power, both from a point of view of aligning with those that do have the sorts of power that they need and also working out how to uh, suppress the powerful people that may threaten them. So what they do seem to display is this type of heroic leadership characteristics that we tend to associate with a lot of the great um, uh, leaders of history. You can see that they're motivated by power, they're motivated by prestige, um, they like the, the trappings of being successful, um, but they lack that concern for people. Often we refer to this as they, um, they lack empathy. And to some extent, you need a little bit of that when you're playing politics. Um, you need to focus on the big picture. And so that lack of empathy with others means that you are willing to do what needs to be done, which might be I need to sack a whole bunch of people, I need to close down an apartment, and I, I can't feel any emotion about it. You know, I need to basically you know, defeat this person and this group in order to get where I want. I need to be ruthless. The problem, of course, is that it's not just being ruthless in a fair way, playing by the rules, they also break the rules. And often it's through things like um, lying to get where they want. Similar to the corporate psychopath, they can be extraordinarily charming. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, a few minutes in terms of their ability to influence and persuade is quite significant. Why are they attractive? Why do we look at these people and go, ah, this is the person who we need to lead us? One of the reasons is because they are the ones who are willing to put through the sorts of challenges or the transformations that companies and to some extent societies often require. Um, People tend to place a lot of faith in these people as saying they're the only ones who can get the, the job done. And they portray themselves in that way. You know, just look at what's happening in the presidential election in the, in the United States. Donald Trump is gaining a degree of support from Americans at the moment because he is putting forward this vision um, of what America needs to be. We need to be great again. We need to take control. We need to reassert our position in the international market and in global affairs. We need to stand up to people. He's portraying this vision. 
you know, he's he's saying that he's the only one who can get it done, and he attacks Hillary Clinton on the basis that she's unable to do this, you know, that she's emotive, she's not well, you know, that she's made blunders in the past. So there's a there's an attack on that individual. So what we see is someone who portrays himself in this way, and people tend to respond you know, to what they see. As I've said, that their self-confidence and their rhetoric can be infectious. And people look to, to these leaders and say, they're the only ones who can get this done, who can change the organization, who can bring in the restructuring that we require, you know, who can protect our borders, in the case of you know, Australia, with people like um, uh, with Tony Abbott and and others, they, you know, they, they they make these grandiose sweeping statements. The use of oral communication is extraordinarily important to these people. It's that's the way that they get change to happen. So as you can see, the two reasons why the narcissistic leader is so appealing to us is because they do in fact have these visions that they're able to. Uh, convey. And then they have the ability to attract followers. followers. As you said, what I've said here, they use um, words in particular, in, in inspiring speeches that can actually change people. They're very, very skillful at this. What's also very important is that the narcissist doesn't just want to be the leader. They actually need to leave behind a legacy. So. A lot of the times, narcissists will, if they get into the senior positions within organizations or, for that matter, countries, they actually want to be able to say at the end of their term, look at what I did. I achieved this. I'll give you an example of that from my own experience at a previous university. Um, we had a change in a, in a leader within our, um, our department, in our graduate uh, school. Uh, this is going back a number of years ago. And one of the things that this person announced was a re-envisioning of the school and its offerings. And he basically put down a challenge that he wanted to reinvigorate certain postgraduate programs. And the directive was essentially, what I need you to do is change the names of these things. I don't care what you do underneath. I need the, the names to be changed so that we can portray to the external environment, we have new products, we have a new masters, we have a change in focus. Whether there was one or not was irrelevant. He wanted to be able to say, I've done this. Are they better leaders? Because of this issue of self-confidence and assertiveness, what happens is that they make a very strong initial impression with group members. You know, um, leaders emerge from groups um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of literature around how the leadership uh, struggle emerges. For those of you who um, were around in the 1980s, you might recall the toing and froing we saw in the Liberal uh, Party between Andrew Peacock and John Howard. That's an example of people that are competing for leadership. What makes the narcissist very appealing is they have that vision. They are very articulate. They're very persuasive. Uh, they're very assertive. So they tend to emerge as leaders within a group. However, what the research has also found is that the increasing displays of confidence, the increasing use of authority to get what they want, actually tends to stifle communication within the group. That leads to a decrease in team performance. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Daniel Goleman. Um, and his uh, emotional intelligence model, which is one of the key um, underpinning models that we use in our MBA here at CQU. What he found was that intelligence as such didn't predict team performance, but emotional intelligence did. Now, what's very, very interesting with narcissists is that we know that narcissists are not very good at transactional relationships. In other words, they're not very good at working with people. They tend to be very good at creating the vision and bringing in transformation. They see people as a means to an end. 
they don't necessarily see people as as people. They are a resource. Uh, but they can, in fact, <clears throat> achieve some extraordinary things. Um, those of you who use Apple computers may be familiar with Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, and um, his um, influence in Apple is quite interesting. Um, if you've read any of the books about him or seen some of the movies about him, you'll see that he wasn't he wasn't particularly well liked by some people. Um, there's a couple of uh, sort of observations by some of his close business associates who essentially said, you know, no one really is a friend of Steve Jobs. He doesn't have friends. You know, he he has resources and he sees you as a resource. Um, it was said that he was quite ruthless with people. And yet, if you look at what was his success, clearly it was the vision. It was the ability to identify where Apple needed to go. Uh, he, along with Wozniak, were the two people that were able to bring Apple to a very successful company. In the early 1990s, I think, he was um, basically pressured out of his own company. And it was taken over by people who thought, all right, now that we've got through this entrepreneurial stage and we've made a foothold, we need to become a serious company. Uh, some of you might remember that the Apple computers of the, the late 80s, early 90s, were becoming almost IBM clones. They were this beige color, square boxes. Um, they looked very much like IBMs. A lot of that little compact, you know, uh, little Mac characteristic had gone. Um, and they'd lost really the innovative space. They were becoming just another um, computer. Steve Jobs was brought back. And the first thing he did was get rid of that design go back to a variant of the original Apple computer, which is a self-contained um, computer and screen, and he, then he changed the colors. And all of a sudden you had red computers, yellow computers, green computers, and that was the introduction of the, the iMac. And it wasn't so much a change to the hardware, but it was a change to the packaging. Taking computers where they'd never been before, they became a fashion statement, and it reinvigorated Apple. And similarly with these ideas to take Apple down the route of a, uh, a telecommunications company, a music company, doing things very, very differently. Those things, the visionary aspects, were the strengths that has continued to be a, uh, a factor in Apple's success. But there is a dark side to narcissism. There is a very negative aspect. And as you can see, one of the problems with these people is they're lacking in self-awareness. Uh, they have a problem when it comes to exercising self-control, particularly when they start to feel threatened. Because they're emotionally isolated, they find it very difficult to relate to others and to uh, rely on others for information. They're highly distrustful of others. The fact that they have this high degree of self-confidence um, means that they believe that their own plans and their own visions are the only ones that actually can succeed. A good example of that, for those of you who know anything about um, Volvo, the Swedish car company, was a the, uh, the CEO of Volvo, uh, a person by the name of Pierre uh, Gillenhammer. He he was someone who brought Volvo to a high degree of success. Um, he introduced new ways of, of building, which was fairly consistent with a lot of Scandinavian uh, approaches to uh, what we call semi-autonomous teams. He wanted to get away from production line techniques in Volvo, increase the craft, craftsmanship of the organization. And it was very, very successful, and he started to become a very, very popular leader. But then he started to push other uh, agendas and one of them was a merger between um, Volvo and Renault. And this was very, very unpopular within Sweden. Um, there was a lot of um, negativity towards this, this uh, merger because the companies were quite different uh, and they occupied different marketplaces. And he just wouldn't listen to any advice. He believed this was the right way to go. And eventually he um, had a revolt from his own company 
um, against his plans, which was tremendously un uh, undermining. And eventually, he had no option to resign after the managers went public, and there was such a huge outcry from the you know from the Swedish public about this merger. It was that steadfast belief that I am right. This is the only way to go, and no one else can actually give insight into this company. So some of the weaknesses of the narcissist leader, they're very, very sensitive to criticism. They are very, very uncomfortable with their own emotions. And even though they provide, they portray this very strong, self-confident position, they're actually very, very sensitive and insecure. They're very poor listeners. They will not hear what needs to be heard. They hear what they want to hear. This lack of empathy is something that they share with the um, the corporate psychopath. Um, then the difference here is that the psychopath actually enjoys um, targeting people, using power to destroy people's careers and lives. They see it as a game. The narcissist is a little bit different. The narcissist doesn't really care about you. They're not out to destroy you. They see you as someone to use or not to use. Uh, you don't matter to them. And that's a, 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 a slightly different way of dealing them with uh, than the psychopath. Uh, the distaste for mentoring, because they're so self-confident, because they believe their vision is the best, they find it very difficult to take advice from others. Um, having a mentor to guide them is something that is just very, very difficult for the most part. The intense desire to compete is something that drives them. They see everything as a competition and they're always looking out for who is the next opponent, who is the adversary within our own company. So even when you shouldn't be competing, you should be consolidating, they tend to want to introduce competitive structures. And there are examples of things like Jack Welsh, you know, who introduced the internal competitive aspects within GE. Some of you might be familiar with some of his strategies. Undeniably, very successful business leader, achieved a lot with General Electric. But he also introduced um, some HR um, policies like uh, there is a defined standard within um, the, uh, the organization, and people have to meet that standard. But the bottom 10% of performers would automatically be uh, discarded. Um, one of the ways we determine who are the bottom 10%, well, there's a use of 60 degree, 360 degree feedback mechanisms. So in other words, the employees themselves had an opportunity to identify who the bottom 10% were. So what was then created was in that culture was a almost like a tradable um, cultural aspect of people rating each other favorably or targeting others to rate them unfavorably so that they could protect themselves. So often it wasn't always reflective of the true performance of individuals as to who was being let go. One of the things that we've also identified is that these negative aspects of narcissists become more and more pronounced as they become more and more successful. So how do we manage the narcissist? Um, despite what we've just said, what um, Michael Maccabee suggests is that we pair them with a productive obsessive, that conscientious control-minded manager. And the idea is that if you pair these two together, um, they will hopefully work in tandem. The narcissist will view this productive obsessive as someone who can make sure that things are ordered and, get, and things will get done. You know, they're the, uh, the person who actually manages all of the resources that are needed to get the narcissist doing what the narcissist needs to do. Whereas the productive obsessive actually understands that what their role is, is to manage the narcissist rather than to manage the resources. And that's why this person has to be very, very sensitive um, and, and is able to um, essentially uh, taper some of the negative aspects keeping the person more on the ground and not really letting them get too much ahead of themselves. So that's really the only advice that people like Maccabee give us. What about if you're working for a narcissist? 
this is a little bit more um, more of a challenge. The first thing is, if you're looking for self-esteem and for pats on the back from the narcissist, you won't get it. And my apologies for the spelling errors that I've just noticed. Um, the narcissist is not going to pat you on the back and say, job well done. They're going to be looking for people to say to him or her, fantastic job, fantastic leadership, great strategic thinking. And he is certainly or she is certainly not going to say it was my team that did it. They like taking all the credit. A good strategy when you're presenting ideas to a narcissist is to try to figure out what they think beforehand. Um, remember, the narcissist does not re relate well to criticisms or views that are contrary to theirs. So you've got to present your ways, your views in such a way that they will look at and say, I can use this, this makes sense. Um, the important issues are the ones you should focus on. Um, people like Maccabee say that narcissists are going to come up with great ideas and really dumb ideas. The good thing about the narcissist is that they usually figure out what those dumb ideas are shortly after they've suggested them. So by you focusing on those critical issues rather than those dumb ideas, that's the thing you should be do, able to do. Um, the narcissist will want you to be available 24-7. Um, the narcissist is going to use you as a resource. Be, pre be prepared, prepared for that. Um, the other thing you need to consider is, is it worth it? Because you're not going to get the credit, you're not going to get the rewards, the narcissist is going to claim those for themselves. It could be like being in a company like Apple that could be a fantastic experience, but it also could be quite a negative one. If we look at some of the things that have come out about the um, last couple of, uh, the last year or so of the Abbott government with Peter Credlin, um, it's clear from interviews with previous ministers, with um, staffers and so forth, that working in that environment with Peter and Tony Abbott was an extraordinarily challenging one and you didn't get a lot of things. So, you know, it's about whether you want to be working with someone that comes from a transactional point of view, in other words, works with you, or someone that is transformational, which basically is, I'm going to push this through. That's the benefit of the narcissist. They have the vision. They often can mobilize people to do this. But it is the downside, and what you've got to do is figure out what the balances are. Is it worth it? And that's the critical issue. That's where I'll stop there, and I'll, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Excellent. Thank, thanks very much, Michael. That was fantastic. Um, it is time, as Michael said, to uh, for question and answers, so uh, please uh, forward those through. We do have, uh, Michael, I do have three questions here that, uh, that have been asked, so I'll, I'll start mm -hmm. with the first one. In your earlier presentation for CCIQ, you talked about corporate psychopaths, and you also mentioned narcissists at, the, at that time. Yeah. Are they the same or similar personality types? Um, they share commonalities. Um, my uh, Now, not being a psychiatrist, um, I can't really make a lot of comment on the um, the medical aspects in terms of the diagnosis of um, of psychopathy but from my understanding um, the the psychopath actually has some um, intellectual disabilities it is an illness in terms of their ability to reason it's 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 not quite um, you know, it's it's not just a personality issue. Um, the psychopath therefore displays characteristics of gaining enjoyment, in particular. They they're, they're thrill seekers. They uh, they do in fact like destroying others. Um, and certainly, I think as I mentioned um, in that presentation I did a, a couple of months ago, I've had the misfortune of working for at least two corporate psychopaths. And it became very clear to me that they actually enjoyed destroying the careers of other people. They liked, um, you know, in, in meetings and so forth, putting these people um, really under the spotlight. And you could just see that it, it, they were gaining, you know, enjoyment of watching these people squirm. Uh, that's a characteristic that is not there with the narcissist. The narcissist is still focused on themselves, 
but they're not out to destroy you. You can either help them get what they want or not. The fact that both of them lack that empathy with others is that's a common characteristic, but it's the enjoyment they get out of it which differs. Most narcissists don't care either way what happens to you, whereas the, the psychopath, in fact, does. They want to see you squirm. They want to, they want to see you destroyed, and they, and they get a kick out of that. They get a thrill out of that. They do share some other common characteristics, and one of them, uh, or a, a series of them, has to do with the fact that they can be very, very smooth. They've, both of them are very, very good at presenting. They're extraordinarily good actors, and they're able to read your emotions. They, they, can, they can figure out what you need, and they can present themselves in that way. And again, if you look at the, the narcissist in terms of the strengths they have, particularly when it comes to presentations, they can sway groups, audiences, and masses simply by the way that they're presenting. So those sort of attributes, they do share in common. But to me, there is a fundamental difference between the two, and that is the narcissist is not necessarily mean. You know, they're, they're not really out to do harm and to hurt. They think they're doing good. The corporate psychopath, on the other hand, they like destroying, and that's what they do, and they do it very well. Okay, I've got another question here, Michael. Uh, it sounds very odd that narcissism is a necessary trait for leadership given narcissists are consumed with themselves. Isn't it odd with with what a leader is supposed to do, focus on others? Um, I think it is odd. Um, you, you would think so. But the, the more you think about it, um, the more it does make sense. Uh, leadership is... Leadership is something which is an extraordinary, uh, it, it's a challenge, it's a difficult thing to do. You're putting yourself in the spotlight. You're actually telling a group of people, I have the answer, I can, I can bring you to this point. You know, we define leadership as uh, the ability to influence people in, in terms of a goal-directed um, behavior. So for you to stand up in front of a group of your peers and to say to them, I can lead you, requires a high degree of self-belief. Not everybody has that degree of self-belief. And I've worked with people you know, who will not stand up, even though they're quite capable. Uh, they lack self-confidence. Or they don't want to run the risk of failure. They want to be the follower, not the leader. So in, from that point of view, I think that some of these characteristics that um, are highlighted is very, very important. The ability to have a vision and to be able to articulate that vision, I think, is, is extremely important in leadership. Um, and I think also the ability to influence. You've got to be someone who can present information in such a way that people are going to listen to you and, and believe in you. And those characteristics are clearly there within the narcissist. It doesn't mean that you can't be a leader if you're not a narcissist. In fact, I would suggest that there are many examples of very, very um, successful leaders uh, around the world and in, in companies that are not narcissistic, but they have these characteristics of vision and self-awareness and uh, self-confidence. But quite clearly, there's a couple of these things that are needed, and narcissists seem to have them. So. I think it probably is an element of saying, yep, yeah, all of us probably need that little bit of narcissism in us to be able to become good leaders. And, you know, sometimes it takes a bit of pushing for those to come to the fore. Terrific. Thanks, Michael. The um, time for uh, one more question, and I think this is uh, probably very relevant uh, uh, point here. You say that these personality types are very skillful actors and actresses, how can we spot mm. them and thus avoid the pitfalls of employing them? Uh, this gets back to um, good HR practices. Um, it's, it's about doing your background checks into these people, uh, making sure that you've looked at things like doing police checks, which is a very inexpensive thing to do. Um, when I was working with 
you know, KPMG, that was a standard. We would always do police checks to make sure that we're not um, employing people that have got a, a criminal record, particularly in things like fraud. Um, companies could save themselves so many headaches by simply doing background checks. Making sure you look at their CVs. You know, um, there's a tendency for people to write CVs now that are that are um, outcome focused. You know, highlighting what they've achieved. Um, I'm not sure that I'm a huge fan of that because it gives it gives you the impression that you know these are all the things that I've done. You know, that I've achieved. You need to explore: is this person also able to work in teams? Can they work collaboratively? If the message is coming through constantly from someone through their CV and in the interview that it's it's me, 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 I, I, I all the time, then I think you've got to make sure that you're able to ask uh, the right type of questions to explore things like collaboration, uh, to be able to explore things like um, resilience, patience, which is an important aspect, um, being able to not go ahead with a, a vision how do they check to make sure that the plan is in fact uh, a legitimate one? It's it's making sure that you do those sorts of basic HR functions, and of course checking with um, referees. You know, if for example a uh, uh, an applicant has not listed anyone from their current or their so say let's say their second last employer as someone for you to contact, that should be ringing some alarm bells and I would be chasing up um, those employers and seeing whether anyone is willing to talk to you about them, even off the record. It gives you some insight into what they're really like in an organisation and the other thing to look for, and this is something they share again with the corporate psychopath, do they only tend to stay in an organisation for somewhere between 12 to 18 months? If you see a constant track record of these people moving employer every 18 months or so, you know, yes for some of them it'll be because they're extraordinarily gifted leaders and managers, for others it'll be because they're not actually very good leaders and managers and they're being moved on. Good HR, do your homework, make sure you've got skilled people in your interview who can ask behavioural questions, who prepare based on their CVs and who ask the right type of questions and usually you'll be able to spot them. Terrific. Thank you very much again, Michael. Uh, well, that's all the, uh, the questions we have time for today. On behalf of CCIQ, I'd like to thank Michael once again for taking the time to present. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us for today's session. Uh, certainly don't forget that CCIQ has a range of webinars and events coming up, uh, including data storage, security and business uh, continuity on October the 11th. We've also got the uh, recruit motivate and manage a high performance team on October the 12th. Uh, of course, if you want to find out more, go to CCIQ events page to book your place. Look forward to welcoming you to another CCIQ webinar in the very near future. Thank you again.